You can you can you can start to deliver your opening statement, please. Okay. Uh, basically, um, who was Prophet Muhammad uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Um, he was, in fact, the seal of all the prophets and and messengers. Um, there were many prophets and messengers that were sent throughout history, and they all had one mission, and that was to call people to worship Allah um, exclusively and to shun and keep away and reject all false deities, which is uh, known as Tagut in, in, in Arabic. And that was uh, their kind of principal responsibility um, for all the prophets and messengers. And the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of, of all the prophets and messengers. And he was sent, in fact, as well as, as, the mercy, um, as a mercy for mankind. Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we sent you not but uh, accept as a, as a mercy for the whole of mankind. So the laws that he came with, the sharia that he came with, the values, um, um, his deen, the haqq that he came with, the truth, the huda, the guidance, all of that is a mercy for mankind. His laws are better than any other laws. Um, they are divine laws, better than any man-made law. His values are better than any Western values or uh, man-made values or his morals, his traditions, his sunnah. Um, they are all better than any other traditions you will find today. Uh, but as well as being a mercy for mankind, Prophet Muhammad wasallam was also the prophet of jihad. He was someone, in fact, there, there is a surah in the Qur'an uh, known as uh, Surah Muhammad, um, and it's also known as Surah Al-Qital, the chapter of fighting. So as well as being a mercy for mankind, he was a prophet of jihad as well. Um, yes, he was uh, a father, he was as well um, a husband, but he was also a leader uh, of, 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 of armies as well, and he fought in many battles. And he was as well a warner and a bearer of glad tidings. Glad tidings. His message was... Um, he also said um, in one famous hadith that the one who hears my name and he does not believe in me, he will have no excuse on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection. So that is, um, uh, 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 he is a proof against you and a witness uh, um, for all those people who disbelieve in him. Any of you who hears his name and you, you fail to believe in him and to accept his way of life and to submit to Islam, you will have no excuse on the day of judgment and you'll be, um, hellfire will be your own um, destiny. And as well as that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, God Almighty, sent him uh, with the guidance. That he sent him with the true guidance and the religion of truth. And this means that all other religions, um, the Christian way of life, if you have a way of life that is, your religions, your, the Judaism, um, democracy, capitalism, freedom, all religions and ways of life, they're all false and rejected. And his true, the deen that he came with, the religion that he came with, that is the true way of life. And, he, and God sent that with the Prophet Muhammad in order for it to dominate the whole of the world, even if the, the disbelievers and the mushrikeen hate it. So, and also, uh, Allah says in the Quran, uh, Muhammad Rasulullah, ma'ahu ala kuffar bainahum, that he is the messenger of Allah and that he is harsh with the disbelievers and he is a merciful, uh, but, uh, merciful with the believers. And that is, in a, in a nutshell, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings be upon him. And I'll pass it on to uh, Sheikh Omar, inshaAllah. Jazakallah khairan. Okay. We'll uh, allow the, our next uh, Muslim debater to take up from here. You have about eight minutes remaining. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. First of all, when we're speaking about the final messenger, or when we're speaking about any messenger of God, we're speaking about a particular people whom God choosing them in order to convey the message of God to the mankind. So God chose a particular people uh, from the time of uh, Adam, Noah, uh, Abraham, um, Moses, Jesus, and there's many prophets between all of them. And the final messenger, Muhammad, may the peace of God be upon all of them. They are the messenger of God has been sent to the whole mankind to ask the people to keep away from any evil uh, actions, evil doing, and to worship none but God and to obey none but God because he is the supreme and he is the only one worthy to be worshipped, to be obeyed, to be followed. And the same, it happened with all of them. It happened with the final and the seed of all the messenger, Muhammad, may the peace of God be upon him. He born orphan. He never was in any universities, in any college as such. 
So we can't say that great leaders of the Muslim nations around the world, which one and a half billion Muslims today believing on, on his prophethood and follow his guidance and teaching. Uh, he was not really like any other leader graduated from university or colleges or even involving in any fightings uh, throughout his life, the way Napoleon or the way Churchill or the way Hitler was. Those who become leaders by force or by violence or by killing. In fact, the final messenger, Muhammad, he was a messenger who from his childhood till the age of 53, never ever involved in any form of fighting whatsoever. Even when he received the prophethood in the age of 40 till uh, he, he fight against those who fight him. It was his age at that time, 53 years old. So he was a leader and he conquered Mecca at that time and opened the whole Arab peninsula. He came to people worship idols. He came to people killing and murdering each other. He came amongst people who do not have any form of civilizations, Arab before Islam. And even until now, away from Islam, they have no civilization to be proud about it except their own language. They used to speak, you see, very classical Arabic. And otherwise, there's nothing unique about the Arab nations. They used to be barbaric murderer, killing each others, uh, uh, raping uh, uh, the strong, eat, eat the weak, and uh, the slave, the people. So he came on that atmosphere where people worship idols, worship God. They made it by their own hands in the beginning of the day, and they eat it at the end of the day, if it's date or whatever. So he came in that atmosphere, and he succeeded to become uh, the person who called him to worship none but God, to go back to the face of Ibrahim alayhi salam, to the Abrahamic face, to the face of believe in God, worship God, watch out, you know, what you are really saying, what you are doing. So the messengers came to tell us what is good, what is bad, what is wrong, what is right. Because man, after all, we God decided to create us to be living in the heaven. But somehow our mother and father, whispered by the shaitan, the satans mislead them and make them disobey God and eat from the tree. And then they lost itself that really, if you like, a, a great, great gardens. So God give them another chance now. You're going to live in the planet Earth, but this time is going to be the shaitans keep whispering to you. So I'm going to send you guidance. Whoever follow my guidance, he will be saved. So all what we are concerned as a human being now is to go back to heaven, to go back to Jannah, where God decided to create us in the beginning, but somehow we did eat from that tree. So God said, Wala taqraba hadihi shajara. Enjoy all the garden, eat from all the trees, get everything, but don't eat from that tree. So the whole philosophy is in this life, don't eat from that tree. And that tree nowadays, it could be fornications, could be adulteries, could be gamblings, could be murderings, could be killing, could be raping, all this, don't do, don't do, don't do, do this, don't do that. So who can decide what is good, what is bad? Obviously, the one who is supreme and all supremacy and sovereignty for almighty God. So now it's not for any man. So the man made laws, whether this law is a law of this man or that man. So Muhammad was not legislators, was not God was not son of God, as people claim, because God has no son, no father, no mother. So he was a messenger of God like any other messengers come before. So his message was worship only one God, and with the Ten Commandments, confirm what come in the Torah, confirm what come in the Bible, confirm all the previous messengers before him, and he as well prophesies is going to be after me on the end of the time is going to be Jesus return back. May the peace of God be upon him. He's going to return back and tell to the people, I am the messenger of God. Because that is the big really test and trial for the Christian people who have been somehow really fold, you see, on the, on the traps. And suddenly, instead to look to him as a messenger of God, they look to him as a God or son of God, etc., etc. So, this is what make me believe in the Christianity. This is what make me believe in the, in the in Judaism. So the Quran told me about that. Otherwise, I would never listen to anybody else. Why? Because I did not see the miracles of all those prophets and messengers. All of them, they perform miracles, but they are tangible miracles. But on the, on the case of the final messenger, Muhammad, may the peace of God be upon him, his miracle, beside many tangible miracles, it was really rational miracle. This is the rational miracle, the miracle by default, extraordinary matter, which is challenge unbeatable. 
So it is that's called miracle. So what is really extraordinary? We see miracles for Jesus touch that people become alive. That's extraordinary matter. It was really no tricks. Even Moses with a stick, the whole sea become two mountain. Even Abraham, they put him in the fire and he was come out peacefully from it. So and many prophets and even Muhammad made the peace of God be upon him was many miracles. But all this I did not see them. We did not see them. So but the final miracles is rational one is Al-Quran. No one can do something similar. No Arab, no non-Arab can do something similar. And that is my rational argument. You see, that Quran, even the Arab Christians and Arab Jews, they cannot do one chapter similar. Where does Quran come from? That's why rationally speaking, existing of a Quran with somebody who speak Arabic so good, but he is illiterate. He don't read, he don't write. And the Arab, they are so professionals in their own language, yet they failed to do one chapter similar, which is three verses, very short, and they used to speak poetry. You see, so powerful. This is why I can say to you, when I have a book or reference, man has no finger on it, I will refer to. And that book's proven to me beyond doubt that there is previous messengers. There is Abraham and Moses and Jesus. That's what makes me believe on them. And there is a Torah and Bible. But unfortunately, the distortion happened in the books, but on the final messengers, the protections for that books in order to become continuous miracle for the people after. So after all, the philosophy of Islam, people can coexist, Muslim and non-Muslims. They can live together under the God, God law uh, peacefully. You could practice what you believe is correct. I practice what I believe is correct. After all, the day of judgment, we will meet with God and he will account us for all our deed. Therefore, as a Muslim, I believe that the guidance, which is I need to refer to, to be my map and the road to heaven, it is must be nobody distorted. And when the distortion happened to the Torah and to the Bible, I cannot refer to them. I believe in its own original form. Okay, Sheikh Omar. Sheikh Omar. Thank you very yes. much. I hate to cut you off. That's all. I'm, I'm going to be like that tonight with everybody. So just don't don't take it personal. But thank you very much for the for the opening statement. We're going to allow the our Christians, Christian debaters here at this point. They have 12 minutes between them. To we'll go ahead and start with their opening statement. Then we're going to go to our first break. So we're going to throw it over to David and Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thanks to our Muslim opponents. We're uh, glad that uh, they've given us this introduction to Islam. I think it's one of the best uh, short introductions to Islam that I've seen. I, I live in America, and many of the Muslims who uh, live here in America are trying to water down the message. They don't, they don't want to offend uh, anyone, but our mu Muslim opponents here didn't hesitate to tell us that our beliefs are false and that their beliefs are true, and, and that's just what you do in debate. And so we uh, hope that uh, the viewers out there, especially the Muslim viewers, won't be offended if we give our view of Muhammad, if we give our honest perspective on Muhammad. You might not like it, uh, but again, this is a debate. We're going to uh, both present uh, our views. Tons of people have come into the world claiming to be prophets, and we can't accept what someone says just because he tells us that he's a prophet. Muslims don't accept everything people believe, and neither uh, should we? We need to uh, test people to see whether the message really comes from God. Now, if someone comes with uh, a revelation or a book, there are three main possibilities we should consider. Number one, the revelation could have a human origin. Sometimes people speak in uh, the name of God when the, message, the messages are really coming from their own minds. Number two, the revelation might have a demonic origin. Christians and Muslims believe in spirits that are in rebellion against God. So we have to consider the possibility of demonic influence when someone tells us that he's speaking for God. Uh, number three, the revelation may actually come from God, in which case we should uh, all submit to it. Now let's apply these three possibilities to Islam. Could Muhammad's revelations have a human origin? I would say absolutely. Anyone who examines Islam objectively will uh, notice that it looks like a religion that came from the mind of a caravan trader in 7th century Arabia. I'll give you uh, three reasons. First, we find all of the building blocks uh, of Islam in the teachings and practices of people around Mecca during the time of Muhammad. There was Jewish monotheism right there in Arabia. There were various stories about Jesus and Mary circulating in Arabia. The Sabaeans, who are mentioned in the Quran, bowed down and prayed at all five of the times that Muslims now pray. 
Some of the Persians believed that after death, an eternity of pleasure awaited them, complete with perpetual virgins called Horis. The pagans, the, the polytheists, performed ablutions. They prayed facing Mecca. They fasted during Ramadan. They took the pilgrimage to Mecca, and they circled the Kaaba. They kissed the black stone. So Islam doesn't look like something that came down from heaven, my friends. It looks like a strange combination of Jewish beliefs, Christian beliefs, and pagan beliefs and practices. Uh, this is exactly the sort of religion we would expect to arise in 7th century Arabia. Second, Muhammad's <laughs> self-serving revelations point to a human origin of his teaching. Surah 4.3 says that uh, Muslims can marry up to four women. But Muhammad had at least 11 wives at one time. So why did Muhammad get more wives than other Muslims did? Well, he received a revelation, Surah 3350, which gave him and him alone special privileges, namely uh, many wives. That's pretty convenient if you're, if you're not a Muslim. Uh, what happens when Muhammad was attracted to the wife of his adopted son, uh, Zayd? He received more revelations. Surah 3337 and 335 justify Muhammad's marriage to the divorced wife of his own adopted son, a divorce Muhammad caused uh, when he was attracted to his daughter-in-law, Zainab. And what about Surah 66, 1 through 2? These verses give Muhammad permission to break his oaths. But the reason for this revelation is very interesting. Muhammad's wives, Aisha and Hafsa, complained to him about having sex with his slave girl until he uh, vowed that he would stop having sex with his slaves. But then Surah 66, 1 through 2 came down, telling Muhammad to break his oath so that he could uh, continue having sex with his slave girls. And by the way, these are just a, a fraction of Muhammad's immoral teachings. Muhammad allowed his followers to hire prostitutes during their military expeditions. He allowed Muslims to rape their female captives, even captives who were married. The Quran allows sex with prepubescent girls. Islam seems to be uh, centered on satisfying man's desires, uh, especially Muhammad's. Third, and I'm only bringing this up because Muslims appeal to science as evidence for Islam, we have to recognize that virtually everything Muhammad said about science is false. Surah 1886 tells us that Alexander the Great traveled so far west, he found the place where the sun sets, and it sets in a pool of murky water. Surah 67.5 and 37.6 through 10 tell us that stars are missiles that God uses to shoot demons when they try to sneak into heaven. When you see a shooting star, it's because God became angry and decided to pop a star in a demon. Surah 65.12 tells us that there are seven earths. Surah 88.20 says that the earth is flat. According to Surah 22.65, uh, um, the, the uh, sky is a, a solid object that, that would fall on us if Allah didn't hold it up. In Surah 27, ants talk to Solomon. In, in Surah 86, we learn that semen is formed between the backbone and ribs. And according to several verses in the Quran, human beings go through a blood clot stage during embryonic development. All of these, of course, are, uh, all of these teachings are, are, are false. They're nonsense. So we have many reasons to believe that Muhammad's uh, revelations have a human origin. But do we have uh, evidence uh, that something um, comes from God? We have evidence, again, that uh, that some of these teachings had a human origin. We have evidence that some of them have uh, something uh, much darker at work. And uh, I'll go ahead and, and give you a few examples here. We know uh, from Muslim records that when Muhammad began receiving revelations um, in the cave on Mount Hira, his first impression was that he was demon-possessed. That's not me saying, that's, that's Muslim sources talking. Uh, then we have the infamous satanic verses, the verses that Muhammad delivered to his followers and later claimed were from the devil. I find it strange that so many Muslims tell me that Muhammad is the, the greatest moral example, that, that he was uh, even sinless maybe, when according to Muslim sources, not according to David Wood or Sam Shamoon, according to Muslim sources, uh, Muhammad committed shirk, the worst possible sin. Uh, so Muhammad delivered a revelation to his followers saying that it was okay to pray to Alat, Alusa, and Manat, three pagan goddesses. And later on, he, he came and said, well, the devil tricked me. The devil tricked me into delivering these revelations. But what that means is that Muhammad admittedly couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. It's also interesting to note that 
Uh, at one point in life, Muhammad was the victim of a magic spell that lasted about a year. It apparently gave him uh, false beliefs and delusional thoughts. And uh, when he eventually snapped out of it, he said, a Jewish guy cast a, a spell on me. Now, that looks awfully suspicious that the, the greatest messenger is a victim of black magic. It seems then that we have good evidence not only that some of Muhammad's teachings had a human origin, but that there may have been something much darker at work in uh, Muhammad's revelations. Now, the, the question is, do we have any evidence that outweighs all of these problems, any evidence that would show that uh, Muhammad's teachings come from God? What do you think about the evidence we've seen so far, Sam? All right. Um, my turn? <clears throat> okay. Yes, indeed. Even before I begin, I just want to ask <clears throat> the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to anoint both David and myself in the power of the Holy Spirit to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, by examining Muhammad in light of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to show that he fails miserably short of the beauty and majesty and the teachings that Jesus, our Lord, brought to mankind. And I pray he'll protect me from making mistakes and representing the Muslim argument <clears throat> and what the Quran and Sunnah teaches. In Jesus' name, I ask all of these things. Let me just jump to the heart of the matter because time is fleeting and I want to cover as much ground as I can. Uh, if the Lord wills, by His grace and mercy. <clears throat> uh, our Muslim, and when I say opponents, I don't mean a derogatory, no disrespect to them. I mean that just in a cordial debate. Our Muslim opponents mentioned this. He said that Muhammad was a mercy for mankind, therefore his laws, laws are merciful, mercy, and better than any other laws. That's what he said. <clears throat> then uh, one of the other Muslims says that when Muhammad came to the Arabs, they were barbaric, murdering, raping, enslaving each other, and that Muhammad came and civilized them pretty much. However, I'm going to ask the audience and my Muslim opponents to consider the following. David alluded to it, but I'm going to be more uh, specific and more detailed as I look at some of the teachings of Muhammad to show that Muhammad's commandments are anything but merciful to men, women, especially children. Number one, <clears throat> the Quran sanctions what we would call today rape and adultery. Now, I know my opponents would not call it rape and will not call it adultery. But again, what would you call the following teaching? Chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 24. Chapter 4, verse 24. Prohibited. Uh, to you are women already married, ex except those whom your right hands possess. So you're not to have sexual relations with married women, except those whom your right hands possess. What in the world does this mean? Well, you don't need to guess. The Hadith, as well as the Muslim commentators, explain the meaning and the reason for this so-called revelation. <clears throat> Sunan Abu Dawood, Sunan Abu Dawood, volume 2, number 2150 in the English translation says this. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri said, the Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Altas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives, took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. So not only do they take captive women and rape them, because I don't know of any captive woman who would be all too willing to sleep with her captor who has just married her father, her brothers, and her relatives. Not only are they allowed to take them and rape them, it says that these particular captive women still had their husbands. Did Muhammad say, yes, you shouldn't do that, it's shameful? No. He recited chapter 4, verse 24, saying it doesn't matter if they have their husbands. Since they are property, you can actually sleep with them and sell them off as chattel. Now I ask you, is that merciful to women? Is that merciful to their husbands? Another thing that Muhammad allowed which my opponents would say has been abrogated. But even in saying it's abrogated, they admit it was permitted initially. Now, the Shiite Muslims believe that this practice continues to this day. It has not been abrogated. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about temporary marriages, uh, muta marriages. What is that? Well, let me let the Hadith explain that to you. <clears throat> Sahil Bukhari, Volume 6, Book 60, Number 139. <clears throat> book 60, Number 139. Narrated Abdullah. We used to participate in the holy wars carried on by the Prophet, and we had no wives with us. So he said to the Prophet, shall we castrate ourselves? But the Prophet forbade us to do that, and thenceforth he allowed us to marry a woman temporarily by giving her even a garment, and then he recited chapter 5, Surah Al-Maida, chapter 5, verse 87. Now let, let me break down the implication of this passage. I know my time is fleeting. Here it's saying that these men could not control their sexual urges. So what did Muhammad do? He said, go into the local village or the city, meet a woman, contract temporary marriage with her. It's not a permanent marital relation. Sam, we're going to have to, we have run out of time. I'm sorry at that point. Right now, uh, Sheikh Omar and also Abu, you have 10 minutes. Whoever would like to speak first, we're going to start the clock right now. 
Uh, if you <clears throat> permit me, if you permit me, I'll go in myself just to fire a few words and leave to Abu Muwahid the remaining, inshallah. Absolutely. First, first of all, the questions uh, of uh, of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he uh, really came or the way he received the revelation he has, it was from somebody before. No doubt, he is a messenger of God and he's confirming whatever come before. So it is. It was before Judaism. It was before him as well Christianity. So that is the only two uh, message from God. We do not recognize the pagans worshippers because these people worship idols. So he confirmed, and God said that in chapter of uh, chapter five, verse forty-eight. وَأَنْزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ so we send, we reveal to you this book confirming all the books have, have come before. More than that, and is abrogating whatever came before. So confirming that this was a message of God came before with a particular divine way of life. But this verse even mentioned that is for every prophet and messengers, we send a particular way of life. But all the same belief, there's only one God and the God is supreme. So God spoke to all the prophets in their own language, in their own tongues to address their own people. So it's nothing wrong for the Prophet Muhammad is really to confirm what is before. But definitely the code of conduct in Islam, you see, as far as the details, economic system, social system, ruling system, political system, foreign policies, punishment system, not existing in the in the Bible, in the Torah, definitely. But it exists similar to the Ten Commandments and similar to the issue of the belief in the hereafters and the day of judgment on the resurrection day, day of judgment, accountability, heaven, or really hell fire. This is issues confirm what is before. Regarding the issues of uh, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha, as he's correctly said, you see the gentleman, he is the adopted son before Islam, it was really before Islam has revealed, before revelation, was people adopting their own children. And Muhammad was not a prophet till the age of 40. So it was not really uh, uh, revealed to him that adoption is forbidden. And he was adopted, Zayd ibn Haris, he was a slave, he adopting him. And therefore they call him Zayd, son of Muhammad, but he was not his son. Then God has you know, forbid the issue of adoptions. And the ayah was making it clear that to... You see, redduhum li abaihim, redduhum li abaihim, refer all the children to their own fathers and mothers. So here he said to Zayd, he used to love him a lot. He said to Zayd, who grown up in his own home, Zayd, your father is Al Haritha, and you should go to your father. Zayd, he reject. He said, I know my father is Al Haritha, but I like to live with you. But he's no longer his own son. Zayd, he has a problem with his wife, he divorced her. So God, he wants to test the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he want to prove to everybody that what so-called son, adopted son is not son. To the level when Zayd divorced his wife, you see the prophet, he get married to his wife. Why? Because at that time she left without any help. She was not really happy with her husband, doesn't want to live with him. But keep the prophet say to her, he's a good son, stay with him. So the end of the day. He is not his son, therefore to say he's married his own, the wife of his own son is completely wrong. The ideas of science, I don't want to comment on every word, but I think really if you refer to certain Quranic verses, you will find that is you are really little bit, really maybe did not read about Quran much. This is why in chapter of An-Nazi'at, verse 31, Allah says, وَالْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ دَحَاهَا The word dahi and the earth, this planet earth, dahaha. Dahi in Arabic means the, the issues of the shape of the egg. That is self called Qurawiya. So who said to you that the land is really, uh, is leveled? So I think people confuse between the ayah. You see, inna madadna al-arda madda, we make it so flat, but it is what? Flat inside, but it's from outside, is completely, really sphere. Therefore, the word dahaha is a spheric one, is not really surface one. The flat one is not really for the shape of the earth. It is where you are, where you stand now, where you sit now, you feel is a flat because you always see in your eyes something in front of you, you see, etc. But the, from outside is completely sphere. Now the ideas of rape, Islam forbid rape, nothing called rape in Islam. Rape is, you see, is something is condemned in Islam. To say it now, that the, the captive female is rape, who said to you that? Even the Sabi, and the slave woman, it is forbidden for a Muslim 
to have with them sex against their own will. So the question is persuasions. The way you sleep with your wife is a persuasion, not by force. Islam forbids man to force you see, his relationship with his wife. So yes, Islam permits man is to have uh, a really a uh, slave woman in order what? In order to free her from the slavery. Most of the slave women, you see, Islam does not permit slaving people. Islam permits freeing the slave. So when they used to have captives, you see, they take it in order to become free women. Now the Sabi is different story. Sabi woman come out with her husband to the battlefield, her husband killed. Those remain women with the children become Sabi and those concubine women, they will be distributed among the Mujahideen to look after them, each one with her children as his own family because her husband being killed. The ideas of, uh, I think uh, the, the gentleman speak about the revelation. The revelation is come from God. And the miracles of Muhammad, and you cannot deny those miracles. Millions of people, really, who have been confirmed saw those miracles. But for me and you, we did not see what the people see in the time of Muhammad. But I saw the Quran, and that is where the big challenge for, for, for the people. I leave now to my colleague to, cap, to catch what I really miss, if anything I'm missing. Thank you very much. Okay. You have about three yeah. and a half minutes. Okay. Thank you, Sheikh Omar. Um, yeah, basically, um, I believe it's the, the person you have in your studio, Mr. Wood. Um, you know, to be honest, um, you mentioned a lot of points there, and I would like to answer a lot of them. But <clears throat> to be honest as well, you've, you've lost a lot of credibility um, because a lot of the things that you said were, were fabrication and, and, and lies, as the Sheikh uh, clarified already, this issue of um, um, rape being permitted and pre -bu uh, uh, pubescent um, intercourse being permitted in the Quran and prostitution, this is all complete nonsense. And the Arabs have a parable, and that is, if you want to lie, don't claim the elephant flies. And, um, you know, uh, you've just kind of like lost all your credibility there. Um, but in terms of Islam and, and the Sharia, ah, of Muhammad being um, divine and just, absolutely. It is the best way of life and the most just way of life. Uh, Allah is Al-Adl as well, the, the one who is most just. And you know, for your information, um, in Islam we don't have uh, human rights. And the reason for that is because our laws are divine from God Almighty, the one who created human life. And His laws do not oppress us, so we do not need to have human rights to stop us from going beyond the limit. Whereas you on the other hand, because you live by man-made law, you need to have these human rights in place because you oppress people so much, you take people's rights and you violate the sanctity of human beings and even animals as well. That You need to have animal rights and human rights in order to prevent yourself from going beyond the limit. And you know, there are many Muslims in Guantanamo Bay, for example, who they don't want human rights. They're asking for, they're asking for animal rights because in the name of Christianity and the name of democracy and freedom, these people are being tortured and waterboarded and, and being kidnapped from wherever they are and they're being made to face um, you know, all, all forms of kind of abuse by American soldiers um, and coalition forces in the name of Christianity and freedom. And even um, in terms of the Qur'an, obviously the Qur'an we know is the word of God because um, unlike the Bible, the Qur'an is, has this challenge which is unde um, undefeatable. It's miraculous in nature. As the Sheikh mentioned as well, um, there's a verse in the Qur'an which says that if you have any doubt that this book is not from God, then produce a chapter similar to it. And you people, you know, you know and those in the, in the studio and your channel, uh, your station, you're more than capable of doing this. You have Arabic speakers who are, some are even Arab uh, native, like Syrian or Egyptian. You have the ability to take up this challenge. So if you doubt it's from God, produce a chapter similar to it. That is the challenge, not for me, but it's from God Almighty. Bring all your witnesses, bring all your helpers and make a chapter similar to it. But you know that you can't do it. Boo, you, you have one get... minute. Okay, thank you. You're you'll, ne you'll never be able to do it. So we know that the, um, the, the Quran is the book of God because there are no errors, there are no contradictions. It's only a lack of understanding from your side. That, that, that's the issue. It's not, there's not any kind of errors or kind of contradictions. And the Quran, for your information, for 1400 years has never changed. Not a single letter or word has been omitted or left or, 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 or lost. You know, the, every, the, the structure of the Quran, every single word, it's, it's all there. There's nothing that has been changed um, in, um, uh, in, in the Quran. Um, and even uh, in regards to, as, as well as uh, in relation to Prophet Jesus, we believe in Prophet Jesus because he's mentioned in the Quran, not because Christians say, oh, there's a Jesus. We believe in him because he's mentioned in the Quran. And because that, uh, and when he comes back, we believe he will return. We believe that he will live by the Sharia of Muhammad and he will implement the Sharia of Muhammad as well, the law of Islam as well. Okay, time's up. Thank you. We uh, now we're going to allow our non-Muslims, our Christians, 
David and Sam, they have 10 minutes, and they can start right now. Uh, I'll just address a few points, and then I'll hand it back over uh, to my friend Sam. I'm, I'm glad uh, our friends admitted that there's no human rights in Islam. That will uh, explain quite a bit uh, as we proceed through this debate. Uh, Notice uh, our friend told us that uh, Islam doesn't allow sex with the Quran doesn't allow sex with prepubescent girls. We're inventing that. So we were accused of deception. Well, if I'm a deceiver, then so are the greatest classical commentators of uh, of Islam, because they all agree with me. Let me read for you briefly the Quran on this. Surah 65, verse 4, And as for those of your women who have despaired of menstruation, if you have a doubt, their prescribed time shall be three months. And of those who have not had their courses. So this is talking about divorce proceedings for, uh, for women who don't have a period for various reasons, who don't have uh, their monthly course. Uh, and it could be for various reasons. Some are too old, and this says some are too young. If you don't agree with my interpretation, let me just give you Tafsir ibn Kathir. And if they want me to read Jalalain, Ibn Abbas, uh, or some modern commentaries, I'd be happy to. Let me just give you Ibn Kathir because he tends to be the most respected. Allah the Exalted clarifies the waiting period of the woman in menopause, and that is the one whose menstruation has stopped due to her old age. Her idda is three months instead of the three monthly cycles for those who menstruate, which is based upon the, uh, which is based upon the ayah in Surat al-Baqarah. The same for the young who have not reached the years of menstruation. They have the same three-month waiting period. So Ibn Kathir, and again, we can go into your other commentaries as well. So uh, here, you're not going against me, you're going against the Quran. And the same thing with the earth, the claim that the earth is egg-shaped. Uh, the, the sheikh said that uh, the, the passage referring to the earth is flat just refers to the way it looks to us. But uh, here again, your, what some of your greatest commentators would disagree. Let me read to you what the Quran says. Surah 88, verses 17 through 20. Do they never reflect on the camels and how they were created, the heaven, how it was raised on high, the mountains, how they were set down, the earth, how it was made flat, how it was made flat. This doesn't say that it looks to you as if it was flat. It says the earth was made flat. And if you don't agree with me, let me again go to one of the greatest commentaries, Tafsir Jalalain. As for his words, sutahat, laid out flat. This, on a literal reading, suggests that the earth is flat, which is the opinion of most of the scholars of the revealed law. Who's that? The experts on the Quran. They say the earth is flat. And not a sphere, as astronomers have it, even if this latter does not contradict any of the pillars of the law. What's he saying here? The Quran says it's flat, so it's flat, as opposed to all the scientists who say the earth is flat. A sphere. So what's he saying? Don't listen to the astronomers. Listen to the Quran. But the Quran here is wrong, and our friends know it, and that's why they're reinterpreting it. Sam? All right. <clears throat> May the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in the power of His Holy Spirit, enable, enable us to speak truth without error. Uh, I want to deal with some of the issues real quick. There's too many issues to deal with, but time is running out. Our opponent said that David Wood was lying when he says that Islam sanctions rape and prostitution. If you remember what I said earlier, from a Muslim perspective, these acts are not considered rape and prostitution because these are acts that are condoned by Allah. However, from a non-Muslim perspective, what do you call <clears throat> this act of taking a captive woman whose husband is still alive and sleeping with her? Moreover, which captive woman in her right mind would want to willfully sleep with her captor who has just murdered <clears throat> her family, her father, uncle, and relatives? In fact, what is interesting and what I found uh, astonishing is that uh, Sheikh Omar said that Islam sets people free. And then he said, that Islam <clears throat> commands the Muslims to watch over the women whose husbands are, have been killed. Killed by whom? The Muslims. So the Muslims murdered their husbands, and now the Quran says, take care of them. How do you take care of them? Surah 424 is quite clear. You can have sexual intercourse with those at your right hand's possession. It is a right that is given to the Muslims by their God. So when you say there is no rape in Islam, you can call it what you want. Those who are non-Muslims see it for what it is. What about temporary marriage? Uh, when, when you go to a woman and tell her, listen, I'm going to marry you for three days, and I'm going to give you a sum of money, but after three days, I divorce you. You're telling me that this is marriage? You can look at the camera and tell your audience, this is marriage? That you go up to a woman with the intention of marrying her for a short period of time, paying her, then divorcing her. That's part of the stipulation. I divorce you after three days. We will call it what it is. It's prostitution. I know you can't call it that because you're Muslims, but we pray by the grace of Jesus Christ, he brings you out of this darkness and into his light. Uh, and then both Muslims said that Jesus is a messenger of Allah who will return 
and he will guide by the Sharia. What's astonishing is that uh, uh, not Sheikh Omar, the other Muslim, quoted Surah 3340, saying that Muhammad is not the father of any of you men, but he's the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. However, this teaching of Muhammad contradicts the Quran. Because according to what, what my opponents are trying to say, Muhammad is the seal. But by Jesus coming after Muhammad, that means you have a messenger and prophet who comes after Muhammad and he abrogates much of the Quran. And why do I say that? According to the son of Muhammad, when Jesus returns, he'll abolish the jizya. There'll be no more payment extracted from Jews and Christians and people of the book. You know what that means? He makes Surah 929 obsolete. If he abolishes jizya, that means he aggregates the Quran. Therefore, the Quran cannot be eternal. And you have a prophet after Muhammad who cancels out the Sharia of Muhammad and many of the commands that instruct Muslims how to deal with non-Muslims. So that is a contradiction. That's a contradiction between the Sunnah and the Quran. Now, how much time do I have? Four minutes. Four, four okay, four minutes. minutes. And uh, Sheikh Omar also said, this is what he said. He goes, Muhammad confirms the books that came before it. He confirms the Torah and the gospel. But then he said, this is what he said in his opening statements. The Torah and gospel are corrupted. You can't trust them. Now, for the life of me, I don't understand how it's possible for Muhammad to confirm the Torah and the gospel that he had access to at his time if they're corrupted. You're trying to tell us that Muhammad confirmed the veracity, the textual integrity of corrupt books? Is that what you're saying? But you are right. The Quran does say he confirmed the scriptures that he had access to at the time of the 7th century. And historically speaking, the only scriptures that he would have access to are the Old and New Testaments that we possess today. But now we have a problem. Instead of confirming them, he contradicts them. Because those scriptures teach that Jesus is more than a messenger. He's the son of God who died on the cross, rose again, and sits enthroned as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Since you just admitted to everyone, Muhammad confirmed those scriptures. Therefore, Muhammad stands condemned by the very scriptures he confirmed. He cannot be a prophet. He must be rejected according to his own testimony. In fact, chapter 10, verse 94 makes it even more explicit. Chapter 10, verse 94 says, if you have doubts concerning what we have revealed to you, and David and I have lots of doubts concerning the Quran, what does it say to do? Go and ask the people who have been reading the scripture before you. Surely the truth has come to you from your Lord. Do not be of those who doubt. The Quran says, if I doubt the Quran, turn to the people who've had the scriptures, meaning Jews and Christians. But if I read their scriptures, my doubts are reinforced. Muhammad has to be a false prophet. You want to take the last minute or two? You said you want to. Uh, sure, I'll go ahead and address what, what I would call the argument from literary excellence that has pre uh, been presented to us. Namely, uh, if you doubt the Quran, if you doubt that it's a miracle, produce a chapter like it. Now, for, for the viewers who've never read a chapter of the Quran, you have some very long chapters, you have some short chapters. Let me read uh, a, a short chapter of the Quran. Uh, this is Surah 109. Say, O ye that reject faith, I worship not that which ye worship, nor will ye worship that which I worship. And I will not worship that which ye have been wont to worship, nor will ye worship that which I worship. To you be your way, and to me be mine. Now, our Muslim friends expect us to believe that no one can write something like that. Now, just to clarify, they mean in the Arabic, but how is the Arabic all that much different from English? In English, it's a collection of words arranged to convey some kind of meaning. In Arabic, it's a collection of words arranged to convey some sort of meaning. Uh, now just think about this challenge in, in general. Suppose I came to you and I said, if you can't write symphonies like Mozart, you have to admit that Mozart's music is the inspired music of God. Now, there you go, there's your argument. Or if I said, if you can't write plays like Shakespeare, you have to admit that Shakespeare's plays are the inspired word of God. Can, can any of you out there write plays like Shakespeare or symphonies like Mozart? One no, you minute, can't. David. So does this mean that these are inspired in any way? No. And suppose, let, let's make it very simple. Suppose I say to, uh, to our Muslim opponents, uh, let's, let's have a rap battle and I'll give you some lyrics. Oh, and by the way, Sam is going to judge our rap contest. Because, I mean, let's face it, this is a 7th century kind of rap battle. My poetry is better than yours, therefore my poetry is the inspired word of God. Suppose I, I sat here and I said, uh, if you other rappers can't write rhymes like mine, you have to admit that mine are divine. How many of you are going to take that seriously? Sam is going to judge. So you come up with a rap better than mine. And if you can't, you have to admit that my lyrics are the inspired rap lyrics of God. This makes absolutely no sense whatever in English or in Arabic. And so the very argument that our, uh, our, our opponents are using to show that Islam is the truth is the very argument we would look at and say, there's no way this argument comes from God because it's absurd. Even if Muhammad wrote the best poetry ever, this wouldn't mean that he's from God. And in fact, we look at it and it's just not the best at all.
Omar and Abu, again, eight minutes divided amongst yourselves. Anytime, you can go right now. Can you hear me? Yes. Abu Muhammad, do you mind me, brother, to start before you? I'm going to answer quickly a few points because it seemed to me the opponent, really, if you permit me to say so, they want to raise a lot of points here and there. Okay, the issue of muta or temporary marriage, as far as Islam is concerned, that is count, we see, fornication. I mean, it's not really marriage. Therefore, if you say to me, there is some people called Shia, they practice it. Yes, there's a lot of people, Catholics, or people, Protestants. There's some people really, uh, 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 really Maronite, Christian Maronite. There's different sects that their own sect. So we don't believe in that. I am Sunni, I'm Muslims from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Nothing in Islam called temporary marriage. The issue of you talking about something which Islam really uh, 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 forbidden and abrogated, this is nothing to do with Islam. The issue of commentary, you keep quoting Ibn Kathir and uh, this and that. I am a Salafi. Salafi means they go back to the original source, only to the Prophet Muhammad and his companions and his families. It's not open for interpretation for me to interpret it whatever I like or for you or for Ibn Kathir. That commentary in heaven was referenced, never was evidence in Islam. The evidence is the revelation, the Quranic text and the Prophet Muhammad. And the understanding of those is those who speak that particular language and they live in that particular era and his companions. And that is called Nahjus Salaf and his families. The questions of Sabi, nothing called captive woman. As you think, go capture woman and rape her or sleep with her. Nothing like this. That reality is was only those women who go out with their own husband in war against Muslims. So that that time people live in the desert. So when they have been defeated, what happened with the women and children? You go to leave them in the, in the desert? So it is really, it was certain circumstances, Islam dealt with it. Today, there's no captive woman. It's impossible. Today, people have their own army, have their own really uh, 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 families. Nobody will take no Muslim woman and make her captive woman. The reality of captive woman no longer exists. If it exists, again, the Islamic rules will be there. Therefore, the American female fighters doesn't count as a captive woman. If being arrested, count as a prisoner of war. She will be treated either to be exchanged or to be free. That's it. There's nothing called, you see, take her and put her part of your families, look after her and the children. And you said the one who killed her husband, he took her. It's not the case. She, she is really with her families or with her husband at war with a particular, they used to fight tribe to tribes. When somebody go to war, used to take his wife and his children with him. So Islam met with these situations, you know, faced the situation with many pagan worshippers practicing. So thank God, no longer captive women exist. The issue of science, I don't want to argue with you and with the gentlemen about, you see, every single word. Science never evidence for anything. Who said to you, any scientific theory was correct or absolutely correct. It's nothing like this. Even, you know, those who said really uh, evolutions and Darwinism and got PhDs in Darwinism and the Big Bang theory, all these issues, it's been proven it's completely scientifically not correct. So science never was evidence. The evidence is the revelations. And that revelations come from God to the messengers. Now, you said, Jesus is going to come at the end of the day. Therefore, contradictions is not the final messengers. Jesus made the peace of God be upon him. He's going to break the cross. To say, no longer anybody can call himself Christians. You are going to be a Muslims. Otherwise, when he said abrogate, it's not abrogate. He just was said, those who are going to accept what Jesus said are going to become count like Muslims. They can't follow the Sharia. If not, they can't as the infidels and kafirs, and they're going to be fought against them. That's why the false Messiah is going to have fight with the true Messiah. The true Messiah is Jesus, son of Mary. The false Messiah, it is Jesus, son of David. So it's going to be problems between the Muslims and those Christians who embrace Islam on one side against the Jews and those Christians who reject the message of Jesus to gather at war. And that is a big conflict. So it's not going to be, and even himself going to follow the Sharia. So when we said the return of Jesus, we don't say it's going to be sent as a new prophet. Having I said that, I must tell you something frankly. The God you believe in is not the God I believe in. Don't waste your time with us. Why? You believe in God came out from the womb of woman. 
I believe in God is supreme, has no beginning, no end, is nothing like him. He has no father, no son, no daughter, no mother. You believe in a prophet came out from a womb of woman, the Virgin Mary. And we believe she is a Virgin Mary and he is really blessing and holy prophet. And that's it really the difference between us and you. So the ideas of son of God and being crucified is completely false. So my advice to you, embrace Islam and stop all this. I pass it to my colleague. You have about two and a half minutes. I'm sorry about that. JazakAllah um, khairan, Shaykh Omar. Again, going back to the issue of the Quran, um, obviously, um, uh, like Mr. Wood said, uh, the Quran is an um, Arabic book. Allah, Allah revealed the, the Quran in Arabic, uh, in the Arabic language. And therefore, what you have there in the studio uh, is, is just a, is a mere translation of the meaning. So therefore, the, the challenge of the Quran is in the Arabic language. And um, it's funny how you, you know, like I said previously as well, that, you know, you're trying to claim that pro prostitution and pre um, pre um intercourse is, um, you know, sanctioned in the Quran, which is complete nonsense. No one will ever accept that. And it's, a, it's just a complete lie and a fabrication. And to be honest, a lack of understanding from you. And um, partly that's probably to blame um, the channels to blame for that because of, of your kind of campaign that you're doing to demonize Islam and Muslims. But obviously, if you look at one thing, in, in, in Muslim societies in, in the Middle East and, and in Muslim countries, obviously none of those countries are ruling by Islamic law, but the people there are Muslim. And if you look at one thing, where is it that prostitution and paedophilia is rife? Where is it rampant? It's in the West. It's in America. It's in, it's in Britain. You know, there's a rape every, um, you know, every day there's rape happening. Every day children uh, um, are being sexually abused. And even by your, many of your Christian priests, how many of them across Italy, across Belgium, in, in, in the UK, in the United States, how many of them are sexually abusing children? It's rife, uh, you know, in the West. Islam does not permit it. Islam condemns it. And Islam came to liberate women as well. You know, previously, um, uh, Islam came to um, abolish this issue of prostitution. We do not use our women as kind of sexual... Abu, you have about one minute, Abu. One minute. Okay, thank you. We do, not use, we do not exploit women. We do not exploit their sexuality in order to make money. Or, or, or you know, in fact, even when the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in his time, people used to bury their baby girls alive because they were so ashamed of it. Islam came and gave them, gave them rights. Islam gave women the, um, the right to inherit. Islam gave, gave women the right to live because they were being killed at birth at that time. You know, Islam gave women the right to participate and, 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 and choose the, 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 the ruler and even, you know, to be um, scholars as well. Some of them, was, um, Prophet Muhammad said, take half of your deen from Aisha, his wife. So Islam gave rights to women that they had to, they had to fight for in the West. Only until the last hundred years, they were given some of these basic rights that were given to women under Islam. Um, 1400 years ago and obviously the, as the Sheikh mentioned he's, he's already cleared up this issue of temporary marriage and, and that is something that is abrogated doesn't exist in Islam and something that is practiced by the Shia and the Abu, Shia time is up um, time okay, is up thank you many of whom are not Muslims thank you. okay we now allow our Christians to make an eight-minute rebuttal uh, may the Lord Jesus Christ be exalted in the power of his Holy Spirit let me just deal with muta temporary marriages I want the audience to pay careful attention to what Sheikh Omar said he clearly said in front of live audience, muta is fornication. There's no such thing as muta today. However, he forgot to deal with the issue that I raised earlier. According to the sunnah of his prophet, according to the so-called sound collections of narrations, Muhammad was the one who instituted muta. Now remember his words, muta is fornication. So he indirectly admits that his prophet instituted fornication for a while. So thank you for confirming my point. Your prophet was not a mercy unto mankind because by instituting, implementing muta, he actually implemented, according to your words, the fornication of women, actually prostitution. So that's point number one. It's irre irrelevant whether it's abrogated today. I'm talking about what Muhammad did, which you agree he did, but then he abrogated it. That's number one. Number two, Sheikh Omar, you said that the only women that you take captive are the women who go to war with their husbands. I'm going to challenge you in front of everyone tonight Show me anywhere in Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24, that restricts this command to only the female fighters, only the women who go out to war with their husbands against the Muslims. That's nowhere in the text. You are reading into the, into the text what you want to read because, again, you see how damaging this passage is to the credibility of Muhammad being a mercy unto mankind. The text says what it says, and the hadiths confirm what the text says. Any woman you take captive, whether she goes to war or not, she is your property. You can actually sleep with her. Now, you don't want to say it's rape, but again, for the life of me, 
Which captive woman would willfully want to sleep with her captor who has just murdered her family? This is clearly rape being sanctioned by the Quran. So that's number two. <clears throat> number three, you said that when Jesus comes, and I want the audience to pay attention to this again. When Jesus comes, he will destroy all crosses because he's going to abolish Christianity. Thank you again for confirming my point that Jesus abrogates the Quran, therefore contradicting Surah 3340. Why? According to you guys, Muhammad brought the last legislation, the last revelation, which cannot be abrogated. It will be valid till the end of time. However, you just said that when Jesus comes, he will abolish Christianity. That means all those verses which speak about Muslim Christian relationships will be abrogated because there'll be no more Christians. In fact, there'll be no more Jews. There'll be no more infidels. So much of the Quran will be abrogated, made obsolete when Christ comes. Therefore, Muhammad cannot be the last prophet, and he did not bring the last legislation because Jesus comes as a prophet after him who abrogates the Quran. Thank you again for confirming my point. The son of Muhammad contradicts the Quran. Therefore, it cannot be from God. Uh, and then you said that nothing in Islam permits marriage with minors or women who haven't had their periods. Now, I know Dave will address that a little more in depth. Mm -hmm. However, what astonishes me is that you as Muslims know that your prophet himself, at the age of 54, after making a marriage contract with Aisha, consummated the marriage, slept with her when she was nine, and he was 54 years of age. Now let me read what Bukhari says about that marriage. This comes from chapter 39 of Bukhari. Now notice the chapter heading. A man giving his young children in marriage. He just said, no marriage with pre -pu uh, pubescence, right? Here is the chapter heading. A man giving his young children in marriage by the words of Allah. That also applies to those who have not yet menstruated. A commentary in Surah 65 verse 4. And he made the idda of a girl before puberty three months. And what example does he give? Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. This comes from Sahil Bukhari. Chapter here it says 70 book of marriage. The subchapter man giving his young children in marriage. So Muhammad is an example of a man who married a minor as an example for other Muslims to follow if they want to on the orders of 65 verse 4. Now I have a lot more to say, but I want to give the remainder of the time to my brother David. Go ahead, brother. Thank you, brother. Uh, well, uh, Sheikh Omar complains that, that we're, we're reading commentaries. Uh, and he says, as, a, as a, a, a Salafi, he wants to go back to a companion. But why did I quote Tafsir Jalalain uh, as a source on the Arabic meaning of Sutahat? Why? Because the Sheikh said, that uh, this only means that it appears flat, not that the earth is actually flat. So we went into a commentary on the actual meaning of a word, and the, according to the Quran, the earth is flat. And up until the modern period, where Muslims now know because of science, uh, that's what your commentators would say. Um, but if you want to go back to an, a, a companion on the, issue, on the other issue that we've been looking at, um, whether the Quran allows sex with prepubescent girls, let me quote you Ibn Abbas, a companion of Muhammad. Commentary of Ibn Abbas on Surah 65.4, which we've already read. And for such of your women as despair of menstruation because of old age, if ye doubt about their waiting period, their period of waiting shall be three months. Upon which another man asked, O messenger of Allah, so this is someone raising his hand while Muhammad is giving this revelation to ask a question. What about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young? They don't have menstruation because they're too young. What does that mean? It means prepubescent. That's the question before Muhammad. And what about, how does Muhammad answer this question? The Quran answers, along with those who have it not because of young age, their waiting period is three months. That's a companion. Now, are our opponents going to tell us that they know? They know what the Quran means better than the companions of Muhammad, then you wouldn't be Salafis, my friends. Uh, but I, I appreciate that uh, the Sheikh, uh, after, uh, after seeing the scientific problems in the Quran, agreed that science is not uh, evidence. I, I disagree whether science can be evidence or not, but uh, since they're dropping the scientific claim of the Quran, uh, I won't dispute it. I did want to add one quick point, uh, because the Sheikh said, that uh, you, you take female captives because, you know, what's going to happen to them? They'll, they'll, just, they'll just die out in the desert. And so it's actually a mercy to take them captives and have sex with them. Uh, I, I, don't, I guess you didn't hear the, the, the passage that Sam quoted from Sunan Abu Dawood. The reason the Muslims didn't want to have sex with these women is exactly. that their husbands were still there. Their husbands are still alive. That's why they didn't want to have sex with these women. It's the Quran that came down and said, no, you can have sex with these women. Which women? These married women whose husbands are right there. 
So do they have people to take care of them? Of course they have people to take care of them. They have their husbands to take care of them. But that wasn't good enough for Allah, who said, you can go ahead and have all the sex with them you want. Now, one, uh, one minute, David. our friend did bring up the issue of uh, something positive from Islam. He pointed out that, uh, that Islam uh, forbid female infanticide. So stop tossing your daughters out into the desert to have them killed. And, and I, I want to uh, agree on this. Uh, I want to be clear here. We're not saying everything that Islam has ever taught is right. false and evil. Uh, if Islam teaches something good, I will acknowledge it. And I, 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 I am glad that Muhammad said, stop uh, tossing your daughters out in the desert. So we're not trying to portray Islam as evil in every possible way. Uh, we don't want to go to that extreme. But at the same, we shouldn't, at the same time, we shouldn't go to the opposite extreme and say Muhammad liberated women. He was a champion of women. That's, that's, that, that's absolute nonsense. In Islam, you beat your women into submission. Uh, you said that you don't treat women as sex objects. Read the Quran, Surah 2, verse 223. Your wives are a tilth unto you. They're your field. They're your property. Approach them as ye wish. These are not, these are not teachings that uh, promote the rights of women or, or uplift women in uh, any way, my friend. Okay, David, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much. We've just uh, finished uh, our portion of rebuttals. We will now go into our crossfire section and we'll start out. Pardon? Could you give us the format for the crossfire? Yes. Um, we'll have a, it's going to be uh, two minutes apiece, uh, two minutes apiece. So each, the Muslims will have two minutes. The uh, non-Muslims, the Christians will have two minutes. Then we'll have uh, two minutes of Muslims, two minutes of Christians, and then another six minutes of Muslims and six minutes of Christians before we go to our next break. Okay. So at this point right now, it'll be a crossfire. It'll be quick. And we're going to start two minutes right now. And I will be giving you a 30-second uh, warning toward the end of that two-minute period. And at this point, uh, Omar and Abu, you have two minutes. You can start right now. First of all, regarding the issue, regarding the issue of Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, yes, the Prophet he married her on the age of nine, and she was at that time reached age of puberty. And the funny things, you are the people who speak about it nowadays, but many Jews and Christians who disbelieve in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was exist in his time. Many Arabs and pagan worshippers, his enemy was exist. None of them attack him because of that, because all of them used to have common practice that if women reach age of puberty, she's allowed to get married. So it's not about having sex with, with women, really, who is not reached age of puberty. This is one, one very important. And the issue now, physically, the people are not the same at every time. Now you can find one young girl, 12 years old in America, but she looked like a wrestler. She looked like 40 years old woman, but she's still young. She's not reached age of puberty. So the question is reaching the age of puberty. Now, the, nobody attacked him at that time, even not the Jews, not the Christian, because they used to practice the same things anyway. But definitely, uh, before age of puberty is not allowed, you see, for people to have intercourse with anybody who is really, uh, even if he claimed that he get married to her. Get married means to have contract to be his future wife. That could happen, could be practiced by some Hanafis. Regarding the issue of the 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 Sabi, I, comple I completely disagree with you. You don't understand me. I said to you the issue of the Sabi is only those women who has been really came out with the own husband not to fight. Just Omar, 30 seconds, Omar, 30 seconds. And the issue of the muta, I said the muta is zina nowadays. Before that, the muta was practiced by non-Muslim Islam abrogated. And that's why the non-Muslims used to be themselves who become Muslim later on. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. We're a little ahead of schedule. We have 10 seconds. But if you're going to allow us to move forward, we will. Uh, David and Sam, you have two minutes. Okay. Uh, I'll take the first crossfire. Go right ahead. Okay, it's my time. Okay, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may enable me to speak truth without error. Okay, he just said that Muhammad married Aisha when she reached puberty. Now, un understand the implication of his statement. If Aisha hadn't reached puberty, it would have been wrong for Muhammad to have married her. Well, lo and behold, according to Sa'ad Bukhari, Aisha hadn't reached puberty when Muhammad married her. Let me read this. This comes from <clears throat> uh, the Sa'ad Bukhari translated by Dr. Muhammad Muskhan Khan, volume 7. And this is the subheading and the hadith number. <clears throat> Number, uh, I'm sorry, 5133, I apologize. Let me read the subheading because my time is fleeting. Chapter, giving one's young child, children in marriage is permissible. Then he quotes 65 verse 4. Now, why is that important? Because 65 verse 4 is about girls who haven't reached puberty or had periods. By virtue of the statement of Allah, and for those who have no monthly courses, they are still immature. That is the commentary provided by the translator himself who was a Salafi. And the idda for the girl before puberty is three months. What is the example he gives? 
of a marriage with a minor who hasn't reached puberty, Muhammad and Aisha. Married Aisha that the prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old, and then she remained with him for nine years. So according to him, it would be okay if she had reached puberty. But your own sources say she didn't reach puberty, so by your own statements, the implication is what Muhammad did was wrong. Beyond that, it's one thing to say a 15-year-old marry a nine-year-old, even though I don't agree with that. That's one thing to say that. But to say a 54-year-old man married a nine-year-old who is old enough not to be her grandfather but seconds. her great-grandfather, we have serious problems, especially when he's supposed to be a role model, not just for seventh century Arabia, but for all times and all peoples. I'm sorry, Muhammad does not fit the profile of one, one to emulate in his actions or his moral teachings. My time is up or I got 12 seconds? Okay. 12 seconds. All right, good. Now, real quickly. Now, here you said no one complained about Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. Next time I'll try and come up and show you that's not necessarily true. But they did complain when he married his adopted son's okay. divorcee. All right. Why did he marry her? Not Mus or Muslims, you, may, you have two minutes. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just want to speak about um, uh, the issue of, um, you know, uh, you've brought it up a few times, this issue of, um, you know, Muslims and, uh, you know, if there was Islam in power and Sharia being implemented, um, there'll be no more Jews and Christians. Obviously, this is, again, another kind of fabrication. You know, Islam is um, pro-life and not against life. And, you know, throughout the history of Islam, Muslims and Jews and Christians have lived peacefully um, side by side. And even there are many Christians living in Lebanon, in Syria, in Egypt, there's no problems there, no kind of fighting going on the way you find in the West. So this issue, I don't know where you got this from, maybe from Fox News or maybe even from ABN SAP probably, dot com. But, you know, we don't, as Muslims, we don't fight Jews because they're Jews or Christians because they're Christians. We, that's not in Islam. You know, the issue of Jews, the conflicts that you're talking about, we're talking about occupiers, people who have stolen Muslim land and have occupied our land and violated the sanctions of Muslims. These are the kind of Jews you're talking about, not just, you know, every, any kind of Jew down the, down the road. And the same thing at Christians. What, what kind of Christians are you talking about? Um, you know, in terms of the Christians that are occupying Muslim lands, again, um, you know, part of the Crusades, killing Muslims, arresting Muslims, torturing Muslims, you know, kidnapping them from their homes, raping women and even children as well. And it's been proven as well. You know, even, even in your own media, you've had no choice but to admit it. Your own presidents admit it as well, that your, your forces have been, your Christian forces have been guilty of raping women and children. 30 seconds, Abu. About pedophilia and prostitution. You know, the nerve of it, the audacity as well. And Islam is very well known that Allah says in the Quran, la ikraha fi deen. We don't force people to become Muslim. That is their own individual choice. Yes, we spread Islam, we go by, by jihad, we open borders, but we do not force individual people to become Muslim. And again, that is another lie. And I hope that one day we can have an honest discussion you know, between Muslims and Christians and stop fabricating. Okay. We're going to move on to the Christians. You now have two minutes. I'll just take uh, real quickly. You said that I said no Jews and Christians in Sharia. No, that's not what I said. Actually, Sheikh Omar said that when Jesus comes, he'll destroy the cross. There'll be no more Christianity. That's what I said in response to his assertion. So if you have a problem with me saying no Christians in Sharia, you pretty much have a problem with your Sheikh. You just condemned him. He said when Jesus comes, he'll destroy the cross. There'll be no Christianity. That's what he said Jesus will do when he returns. Secondly, you say we don't fight Jews and Christians for their belief. Yes, you do. That's Surah Al-Tawbah, chapter 9, verses 29 to 31. There it says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, nor the last day, nor forbid what Allah and His Messenger have forbidden, nor uphold the religion of truth, even if they are of the people of the book. Then it goes and say that the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, Christians are the son of Allah, and this they imitate the dis disbelievers of old, may Allah fight them. So yes, you do fight Jews and Christians and subjugate them because of their beliefs. That's in your Quran. Now I give it over to Dave. Uh, so, yeah, no, notice uh, our, our friend said, uh, but American soldiers do bad, modern armies do bad things and so on. Yeah, but here's the difference. When an American soldier does something, and if, if an American soldier rapes uh, a Muslim woman or any other woman in a war, we will condemn it. We Amen. will say that was evil. That man should be punished. What do you do when your Quran says fight the Jews and Christians because of their beliefs? What do you do? You say, oh, it's, it's good. What do you do when, you're, when Muhammad says, and let me quote this, because you say you, you don't quote because people believe differently from you and you don't fight people so that they become Muslim. Let me quote quote Sahih Muslim number 33. The messenger of Allah said, I have seconds. been commanded to seconds. fight against people 
until, till when? Till they stop attacking you? Till they stop oppressing you? Till they stop raping your women? No, listen, I have been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and they establish prayer and pay zakat. And if they do, if they do all that, then their blood and property are guaranteed protection on my behalf, except when justified by Allah and their affairs rest with Allah. So you fight until they become Muslim. You're contradicting your own prophet. If you can start right now. Okay, right now I'm going to start straight away. First of all, regarding the issues of Aisha, I repeat again, he did the contract of the marriage on the age of seven, but the intercourse not before she become age of puberty. This one, and don't repeat it again for your real time. The issue of Christianity on the end of the time, Jesus come to come to abrogate the false Christianity because we believe your Christianity today is false one. The true Christianity was in time of Jesus and his student. After that, St. Paul, who Mr. Saul, who really fabricated all the story, which all your religion based on, is going to be abrogated. Now, that abrogated is not for the true Christianity. He's going to stop you from worshiping him as God and say to his messenger of God. Regarding the issues, uh, gentlemen, he was, I'll leave it to my colleague. Okay, Abdul, uh, take it, Jalal. Abu Mohid. Abu? In regards to the, the issue of the Jews and Christians, I was speaking about today, you know, where do you find Muslims fighting Jews because they're Jews or Christians because they're Christians? The reality is that there are Jews being fought because they're occupiers. There are Christians being fought because uh, they're, they're, they're occupiers as well. It's not because, you know, the, the people are not fighting because they're Christian or Jews. That's not the reason why there's uprising in the Middle East. And um, again, like, like the Sheikh has clarified over and over again, this issue of Aisha has been um, kind of clarified many times and Islam does not permit kind of prostitution as well and prepubescent, you know, intercourse. It, it's being condemned, you know, it's not permitted, it's not sanctioned in the Qur'an. So for you to keep bringing it up, it makes your argument very weak and very shallow as well. In fact, you don't really have any argument, all you have is falsehood. And that is very clear from, um, uh, to all your viewers that are watching today, that all you have is falsehood. And obviously, we don't quote the Bible the way you, you know, the way you quote, quote the Qur'an. Because we have a better guidance. Our, our guidance is the Book of Allah, it's the final revelation. We don't need to quote your Bible. Everything that the Qur'an has, has brought to us, it's abrogated all the kind of previous scriptures, it's confirmed as the Sheikh said, confirmed the previous scriptures, but abrogated them as well. And we have the final testament with us, which is the, which is the Book of Allah and the Quran. And I'd, I'd like to invite you all, because I know you're going to have the last word, I'd like to invite you all to Islam and to submit to um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to obey him and to stop, not worship the cross or, or Jesus, but to worship Allah Almighty and follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and to believe in his book. Okay, you still have about three and a half minutes. Oh, really? Do I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sheikh Omar, you can, uh, if you like, Sheikh, you can add something. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. I think the gentleman, he, he was saying something about the issues of uh, the mut'a is fornications. The mut'a nowadays count as a fornication and Islam is forbid it. Now, before that was nothing called mut'a by the mean of temporary marriage. That's completely different. The ideas of marriage, it is for life, is not temporary. Never was temporary. That was practicing before Islam was not called temporary marriage or muta. You see, the muta you are talking about is different than what the Shia introduced. So I think you should really just need to read it a little bit. And I am fully really aware that is you have disagreement with Islam, but please at least keep stop quoting people you like and quote only the Quran and the Sunnah. You are quoting and making commentaries of you or some people, you want to want to commentary on them. And you know commentary never was evidence in Islam. Anyway, this is all what we can say today. I hope we can meet in the future with better you know, time and better debate. Thank you very much. Okay. We still have two and a half minutes left, but if you're willing to move on, will you allow our Christians six minutes? Mm -hmm. I still have two and a half minutes. You have two and a half if you want to use it. Yeah, I can use it. Go, ahead. go right ideas, ahead. Sorry, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, I, the ideas uh, God ordered me to fight people until they embrace Islam. It's absolutely correct what he said on Sayyid Bukhari. He said, Allah, God ordered me to fight people until they testified no one worthy to be worshipped but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger and to pray our prayer. If they do so, their own life will be protected and their own wealth will be protected. But this hadith got another hadith. If what? And if they accept to live with Muslim under covenant of securities, they will be their own life and property protected. That's why there's many Jews and Christians for 1400 years existing in Middle East. 
because they accept to live on the covenant of security with Muslims. So either you embrace Islam or live in peace. Even the Red Indian said, in peace we come to live with you. So nobody going to force you to become Muslim. But the reason we fight each other, yes, because Muslim and no Muslims. Nobody doubt that your life and property has no protections except if you embrace Islam or if you accept to live with me in under the covenant of securities. I live in your countries. When I came to your land, under the covenant of securities, I do not fight you. I live in London for about 25 years. I never violate, you know, the sanctity of any person. I never even have traffic, you know, or, or a parking ticket. Why? Because Islam forbid me to live amongst people and to fight them. So the covenant of securities, Abdul Aman. About one more minute. Okay, this is the key. So correctly, you said we fight people, and for the sake to be the word of God is highest, and to make Islam prevail, but not to force them to become Muslims because no compulsion in religion. And thank you very much to remind me about the two minutes. After all, I don't want to donate it to you to keep another distortions. I donate it to Abu to Abu Muhammad. Gotta appreciate your sense of humor. Uh and David and Sam, you have six minutes. Right. <clears throat> Again, I want to just glorify and praise our God and Savior Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved for a uh, wonderful exchange, and I thank my Muslim opponents for a cordial dialogue, debate. Yeah. They're very respectful, and I thank them for that, and I hope and that in the future we can have such discussions to arrive at truth. Uh, let me just real quickly deal with some of the issues that my Muslim opponents brought up, and then I'm going to hand it over to David, and again, trusting the Lord to enable us to speak truth at all costs without error. Um, <clears throat> they said that Muhammad did not sleep with Aisha before puberty. Uh, Muhammad waited until she reached puberty to marry her. Again, this contradicts their own authentic sources. For example, Sahih Muslim number 5981, Sahih Muslim number 5981 says, Aisha reported that she used to play with dolls in the presence of Allah's messenger. <clears throat> and when her playmates came to her, they would leave the house. So when Muhammad married her, she used to play with dolls. He took her into his house when she was playing with dolls and she would swing on swings. Now, according to Ibn Hajar al-Askalani in his commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari, this is Ibn Hajar in his commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari, the reason why Aisha was allowed to continue to play with dolls, and these are the words of the translator, Dr. Muhammad Muskhan Khan, because she had not reached puberty. So according to the authentic sources of Islam, Muhammad at 50 or 54 consummated marriage with Aisha when she had not reached puberty. And don't forget this. When we say that she was nine years old, that's according to the lunar calendar, because Muslims go by the lunar calendar. If we go by a solar calendar, she would have been younger than nine. So that's number one. That's the first point. The second point, <clears throat> uh, Abu said that the Quran nowhere exhorts Muslims to fight Jews and Christians for their belief, but fight them for their oppression. What I find ironic is that Sheikh Omar contradicts his pupil, because if you heard what Sheikh Omar said, he goes that David is absolutely correct that Muhammad was ordered to fight people until they believe in Islam. Notice what he said. Muhammad wasn't ordered to fight people who oppressed him. He was ordered to fight and subjugate people because they didn't believe like him. So now, Abu, you have to take it up with your, your uh, sheikh who contradicts you, confirming that the Quran and the Sunnah exhorts Muslims to fight people, especially Jews and Christians, because of their beliefs, not their oppression. <clears throat> and because time is fleeting, I'll make this my final point. He said again, Sheikh Omar repeated, that muta is fornication now. But muta was being observed before Muhammad. Now here's my question to my Muslim opponents. If Muhammad could do away with such humane practices as adoption, don't forget, adoption was being observed before the time of Muhammad. What did he do with this humane institution? He did away with it. If Muhammad could do away with an inhumane practice such as burying infant girls alive, why didn't he prohibit muta from the very start why did he permit it and then abrogate it? So according to Sheikh Omar's own criterion, Muhammad admittedly allowed his Muslim uh, fighters, jihadists, to commit fornication. We would call it today prostitution. Now, I had a lot more to say, but I'm going to hand it over to David, and may the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in everything we say and do. Amen. Sam, uh, I, I'll try and sum up a bit. Uh, notice that Sheikh Omar uh, ordered us not to quote commentaries, and there's a reason for that. Your greatest commentators, Ibn Kathir, the two Jalals, Ibn Abbas, they agree with who? They agree with Sam and me. That's your greatest commentators are on our side. Uh, Abu said we don't have 
arguments, we have falsehood. But actually, we laid out a very careful argument from the beginning. We argued, number one, that uh, Islam looks like a religion that arose in 7th century Arabia. Now, Sheikh Omar didn't dispute this. He said, of course, Islam is going to have things in common with previous religions because uh, it's a continuation. But we didn't, just, we didn't just cite examples of Christianity and Judaism. Why do Muslims uh, take the pilgrimage to Mecca? Why do they bow towards the Kaaba? Why do they kiss the black stone? Why do they perform the, the ablutions? These were pagan practices. So it looks uh, like you have a lot in common, not just with Judaism and Christianity, but with paganism. Uh, the issue of the self-serving revelations. Uh, Muhammad received all kinds of revelations that seem to have no point other than satisfying his desires. And if you have a problem with me saying that, Aisha said the exact same thing in Sahil Bukhari, where she said, uh, my, your Lord seems to hasten to satisfy your desires. This was directed towards Muhammad. We uh, address many scientific errors because this is such a common claim in Islam today, uh, but our opponents didn't defend the Quran uh, from uh, the scientific problems. Uh, the demonic issue, uh, that Islam doesn't just look like uh, something that had a human origin. Some of the teachings uh, seem to have something spiritually wicked behind them. Uh, Muhammad's first impression of whatever he encountered was that it was demonic in nature. We have the satanic verses. We have Muhammad being a victim of black magic. Uh, these went untouched throughout the debate. Uh, so this all comes down to what evidence do we have for Islam? We've seen we have a lot of evidence against Islam. The only two uh, arguments I could, I could clearly distinguish here were the argument from literary excellence. The Quran is so wonderful. The poetry is so good. It must be from God. But we saw that this would be absurd. And besides that, it's just false. Look at, look at the people around uh, Muhammad during his time. They rejected this argument. Muhammad won very few followers when he said, listen to my poetry. He won vastly more followers when it was, let's go out and get the war booty. And finally, we had the argument from good teachings. Uh, Muhammad's teachings are good, but we saw massive problems with prostitution and sex with uh, little girls and so on. These are massive problems. And so based on the evidence we have here, I would invite our, our opponents and every Muslim out there to reject Islam. Amen. Now, the question still is here. Uh, is Christianity true? We haven't discussed that tonight, but we'd be happy to defend our beliefs. And I assure Amen. you, we can give a much stronger case than we've seen for Islam. Okay, great. Now, so we are done with our conclusions at our crossfire at this point. We have we have a caller on the line, and By we the will... way, before we take, can you set up how it's going to be? Yes, I should. I apologize. Thank yeah, you, so Sam. We, we have about twenty-five minutes left in our program, and we will tell everyone. I, I may, must. Uh, that's a good point. I'm glad you mentioned this. We will. <laughs> a fifth, fifth, I'm sorry. We have fifteen minutes left. We will make this very clear to everyone here, as we have all this this whole program and watching our time. We will also watch our time with our callers. So one question, tell us your name and tell us your question, and then we have to move on. We want to try to get as many as we can. So I know it's Tony. Tony, what is your question? Oh, so uh, again, sorry. not to the, how much time do the people have to respond and the counter response. So if it's if to the Muslims, they have how many minutes? And yeah. do we have I would say we'll, we'll give them roughly about a minute or so to respond okay. and then you know, a minute for a rebuttal. So okay. we'll, we'll watch the clock on that, but we're going to be trying to reasonable. So, but, so just to clarify, whoever yes. the question is directed to gets a minute, and yes. then whoever it's not yes. directed to gets a minute for Correct. Okay, that's Correct. Fine. Tony, I know you're on the line. Tell us your question. Who's it directed to? Mm. Yeah, my question is for Abu. Uh, first off, I didn't know that, that American forces were fighting in the name of Christ. That's, that's news to me. But my question <laughs> is, um, you, you keep saying that Islam does not exploit women like the West. What do you make of Islam's uh, concept of paradise, uh, where there will be perpetual virgins with large breasts yeah. uh, who, and men with eternal erections? That makes our porn in the West look like uh, Sesame Street. I'd rather have God's glory for eternity than the hooties with the booties. Abu. Yeah, that's all i got to say. Thanks, Tony. Abu. Again, uh, yeah, there's been an exa exaggeration of the verse, and obviously the hur um they are women of paradise that will be given to, uh, uh, you know, um, as a reward for the for the for the martyrs, and uh, obviously that is a gift, um, a, a reward from Almighty God in paradise, and obviously we can be you can be as envious as you want of that, but that that is open that reward is open for you, uh, for anyone of you, you know, if you want to embrace Islam. And you want to, you know, commit to Islam and, and die as a martyr, then that reward is open to you as well. So um, again, there's a bit of exaggeration on the on, on the verse, especially the last part that you mentioned. But obviously, um, absolutely, there are um, virgin women for the Muslim men in paradise. And then, Alhamdulillah, I hope that Inshallah I die as a martyr. Um, Allah is me shaheed, and I hope that I get that reward. I've got no, nothing to, you know, feel shy about that. Okay. okay. And one minute response. Uh, and, and we have about ten seconds left. If you want to make any additional comments. Time's ticking away. 
Right. Yeah. I'll, let, I'll let our Christians respond to that one. You have one minute. Okay, glory to Jesus Christ. The heaven that awaits the true believers is not a brothel in which you'll have eternal erections deflowering virgins for all eternity. None of us are envious of that. If this is what you call paradise, you can keep it. What awaits the true believer is dwelling in the presence of the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The greatest joy that a Christian has is not the flowering virgins for all eternity. The greatest joy that Christians have is to bask in the infinite beauty, majesty, glory, love, joy, and peace of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Your hurries uh, pale by comparison, infinitely pale by comparison to the infinite majesty of Jesus Christ. I pray in Jesus name he saves you from this darkness so that you don't be eager to die for a false religion to go to a paradise that doesn't exist I pray you turn to Jesus and enjoy his infinite pleasure a pleasure that words cannot describe because there's nothing like Jesus Christ our God and Savior amen okay we have another caller thank you gentlemen we have another caller brother Tidor you have uh, a question and who is it directed to hello hello gentlemen good evening how am I uh, Yes, my name is Theodore. I want to ask a question to Mr. Sheikh. Your question. Good for everybody. Thank yeah, you. Very quickly, please. Why, Mr. Sheikh, why you are Islamic? All of you, do you want to kill Christian Jew, Israel people rather than see? As a plan, before the Sea or after the Lord to Israel. If you, as Palestinian Arabia, go to. Okay, okay, we don't need. What is. I'm not. We just. Yeah, we got. We made the question. Kill Jews and Christians, right? Okay. Uh, Omar. Sheikh Omar, you you have one minute to respond. I, if he didn't hear it, could you re restate kind of the? Uh, I, 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 I can. Re did you understand the question, Sheikh Omar? I did not hear the question. He speaks Chinese, but oh, I would like okay. to <laughs> what I understand. You see, my understanding first of all, before Islam was the Abrahamic faith existing in Mecca. Who built the Kaaba? Is Ibrahim and his son Ishmael, and he is the one who used to make tawaf. He's always to kiss the black stone. So the Muslims used to follow the previous messengers, not the pagan worshippers. For God's sake, Islam condemn any pagan worshippers, any pagan way of life, but confirm the true Christians and Jews who was existing there in practice. But unfortunately, they have some distortion in their own books and they believe Jesus is the Son of God. The question the man he asked, I did not hear it. If you tell me what the question is, I will answer straight away. Oh, you have 15 seconds now. He said, okay. uh, why do you order to kill Jews and Christians? But your time is up. Because, because they are occupiers of Palestine, oh, not so. Jews and Christians. Occupiers of Palestine, the occupiers of Chechnya, the occupiers of, of, uh, of uh, Kashmir, the occupiers of Afghanistan, occupiers of the others. They are Jews, Christian, Hindu, Sikhs, okay. Greeks. Okay, whoever that's it. I guess mm -hmm. occupiers. Time right. to respond. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the question was, why do Muslims want to kill uh, Jews and Christians? And the Sheikh keeps saying, because we're, we're occupiers. That, again, that's not what the Quran says. Surah 929, Sam quoted it, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Not fight those who are occupying you. Fight those who are oppressing you. No, fight those who do not believe. Look exactly. at every criteria of fighting the Jews and Christians in that verse. It has, to, it has to do with what we believe and it has to do with what we practice. Nothing about us oppressing you. It's fighting us based on our beliefs. And you find that, you find that over and over again in Surah 9 and elsewhere. Uh, not only that, I want to real yes. quickly add to what David said. He just said because they occupied Muslim lands. Now, are you going to be consistent and condemn Muhammad and his followers because they stole the lands of others? People who never oppressed Islam, uh, Muslims, never heard of Islam, they went and took over their lands, so they were occupiers. So, Sheikh Omar, are you going to be consistent and say Muhammad and his followers stand condemned by your criterion because they stole the lands of Jews and Christians and as well as the Hindus? And we can conclude with free Mecca. Amen. It was taken by he Muslims. He stole it from the, it was the stolen pagans. from the pagans. Exactly. Return so it by to your the pagans, criterion, you condemn we'll Muhammad. Okay, we have another we have another caller and uh, sir, could you tell us your name and your question? Uh, to the Muslim guests, uh, thank you for engaging in a respectable debate. Mm -hmm. I would yes. like to take this time to invite you to the true original Islam, and that is submitting <laughs> to the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. who is God incarnate. Amen. My question is for the Muslims, you mentioned words to the effect that Islam is the solution. I'm wondering what the Islamic solution is for homosexuality, and more importantly, would you practice that solution on your children, God forbid, should they be afflicted with the sin of homosexuality? And to David and Sam, great job. Please follow up when the Muslims spin and refuse to answer my question. All glory Thank to you. Jesus Christ. Okay, you, uh, is this uh, Omar or Abu? Wants to answer. We have one minute. You, either one. 
Excuse yes. Me. As far as homosexuality is concerned, it's, it's forbidden in Islam, in Judaism, in Christianity. I don't think Jesus, when he comes to the temple, back home to say, long live homosexual people. Unless you believe that, or you be inside, I never know that. So definitely homosexuality is condemned by the prophet Lut and the prophet Abraham and Moses and Jesus and even the final messenger Muhammad. And this is the matter, is it clear? And really, the other things really, I will leave it to my colleague, you know, Abu Muwahid to say it because I'm not hearing, you know, what you are saying. Abu? Uh, yeah, I didn't really catch that myself. But just to say, just to add... Um, one point. Um, I've got a question myself, actually, because um, someone sent, sent me a message as well saying that, you know, does the Bible permit um, incest? Because obviously there's a verse in, the, in, 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 your, in one of the chapters there that permit incest and even the issue of Satan overpowering God. But that's, that's one issue, you know, because there's a lot of contradictions on your side, you know, speaking about pedophilia and rape, and yeah, it's so rampant. In okay, Abu, I'm sorry, our time is up. Okay, David and Sam. Uh, let me quickly address what he just said. Instead of addressing the question directly, David Angel said, does, what is the solution of Islam concerning homosexuals, and would you implement the ruling of Islam if your children, God forget, forbid, became homosexuals? Notice they never answer that question, because they won't, because they understand that if they were to say that according to Islam Sharia, shari homosexuals must be killed, they know that won't fly too well with Westerners and secularists. But then he turned his, his attention to attacking the Bible. The Bible permits incest. Well, since you didn't mention the chapter or verse, I don't know what you're alluding to. However, isn't it ironic that earlier you said, you said, Sheikh Omar said, Muhammad confirmed the Torah and the gospel. He confirmed it, but then he abrogated it. Now, it's different to say that he said the scriptures were corrupt. Nowhere does Muhammad say the scriptures were corrupt. Abrogate is not the same thing as saying it's corrupt. You just attacked the very scriptures that your prophet confirmed, further proving he's a false prophet. You're saying the Bible is full of contradictions, but you just admitted that Muhammad confirmed the Bible, therefore it's full of contradictions. Muhammad was wrong to confirm it. So by your criterion, you condemned Muhammad. So why are you a Muslim? Is the clock working? No. Okay, we're gonna take the next caller. Lewis, what is your question? And who is it directed Hello. to? Uh, it's directed to Sheikh Omar and Abu. Now, you said Islam is a tolerant religion, and you make it, and you said that Jews and Christians live in Muslim lands. Now, as Salafis, I think you would, you would follow the example of one of your rightly guided caliphs, Umar bin al-Khattab. And uh, your question, isn't, it Lewis? True that, isn't it true that Umar, when he conquered the Jews and the Christians, allowed them to live on the condition that they can't, build new churches or repair the, the ones that they have that are dis, in, in disrepair. They can't imitate the Muslim dress or hairstyles or anything. They can't have public processions. They can't recite their holy book. What is your out question, out. Lewis? Isn't, I'm just say, I'm asking them, isn't it, aren't these things true? If, as Salafis, do you believe these practices should and be Christians enforced? will be oppressed and forbidden from building churches and so forth. Did you get the question, Omar and, and Abu? I get the questions. Okay, go ahead. You have one minute. Yes, yes. In Islam, uh, it's not allowed for you is to build a new church. The churches you have, you can remain them and you can uh, look after them, but you cannot build a new church. And I ask my colleagues or your friend, I don't know his, his name, uh, can you just because he said there's nothing called defend yourself. Can you fight, you know, chapter 2, verse 194, whoever attack you, attack him back, regardless if it's whatever his religion. This is really, if you read the Quran now, go to the chapter 2, verse 194. And more than that, about distortion of the Bible, you say you can go to chapter 4, verse 46. God said they distort their own books. The Old Testament, the Jews, you know, distorted. And this is really the fact. So I'm sorry, I'm using the answering of the man straight away. And I'm even by capitalizing on the time to answer another point. Those two chapters and two verses, chapter 4, verse 46, and chapter 2, verse 194, please read them, you, oh. in your own translation. Thank you, I'm Omar. David and Sam. Yeah, uh, you know, it's ironic. He quoted chapter 4, verse, 4, 40, chapter 4, verse 46, saying... Uh, that the Jews somehow corrected their scriptures. Uh, Sheikh Omar, it's obvious you didn't even read chapter 4. This is talking about the Jews twisting the words of Muhammad. That's chapter 4, verse 46. That passage is not talking about the Jews corrupting the Torah. It's the Jews twisting the words of Muhammad. It's right here. It says, they say to Muhammad, we hear and disobey. So according to you, the Jews corrupted your Quran. Thank you. So thank you for proving your Quran is corrupt. Why do you believe it? There's another passage that proves that it's your Quran corrupt, not the Bible. 
Surat al-Hijr, chapter 15, verses 90 to 91, it says, Woe to the dividers who tear the Quran to shreds. So thank you for proving that the Quran testifies. Jews corrupted your Quran, but nowhere does it say it corrupted the Torah or the Gospel. So you're mistaken. I only have a few seconds, so I'll just say that the Sheikh quoted Surah 2 to show that Islam allows fighting and self-defense only. Uh, you know that's been abrogated by Surah 9, which commands you to fight people based on their beliefs. Okay, uh, we have one last caller for the evening. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. His name is Jeff. What is your question and who is it directed to? It's directed to uh, Omar and Abu. First of all, I'd like to say that Brother David and Brother Sam are doing an excellent job. I've been uh, listening to the debate, and I noticed that when Brother David and when Brother Sam make a claim against them, Islam, they'll use the Quran and they'll use the Hadith to support their claims. But the uh, Muslim brothers, they, they, when, they make, when they attempt to deny the claim, they never use their sources to deny exactly. it. They just say it's wrong, you're false, you're a lie, but they never support it with any... Uh, the Thank you, sir. We need your question. We appreciate your observation. What is your question? And we'd like to give them a chance to respond. Jeff? Your question, Jeff. Did we lose Jeff? Jeff? My quick, oh, go ahead. Quick, your question. Why, why don't the Muslims respond to uh, the, the assertions of Brother David and Brother Sam? They use sources. Brother David and uh, Brother Sam, they quote the Quran and the Hadith to support their claims. But the Muslims, all they do is deny, but they don't use any sources. Uh, to back up what they believe. And, and why don't they? Why don't they? Omar and Ob Abu, you have one minute. I leave it to Abu, but I can tell you, we have answered all what you said from the Quran, but you keep quoting your own verses the way you like it. If one verse, you leave the other verse. Other verse said you defend yourself. Now you said it's abrogated. Nobody said to you, Jihad, abrogated. Self-defense and offensive, both are in Islam available. I will conquer the world to establish Islam. I will defend my land from anybody who wants to attack. Abu Muwahid, you can take the remain. Yeah, um, basically, uh, Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Omar. Um, uh, Basically, you know, to answer your questions, because obviously, if I did miss any, or if, if the sheikh missed any, we don't do it deliberately, because you ask, so, you raise, you raise so many issues. But in relation to children committing homosexuality, children are, are not accountable in Islam. You know, what a child does, any kind of sin they do, they're not accountable. We don't believe like you do that they're born with sin. We believe that they're innocent, in fact. So that if a child was to even, you know, I don't even think a child would even do that, but if, if they were to do that, whatever it is, any kind of sin, they're not accountable when they're children. And the other issue is about the Bible. The, the, the Bible... Uh, oh, today, okay, Abu, it, we're it, done. We're done. Sorry, we have to make this brief. Gentlemen, any last comments? Uh, real quickly. quickly, he's got to respond to that because it's his turn. Just real quickly, uh, you just said that Islam doesn't acknowledge that people are born in sin. We're going to offer a debate challenge. We're going to challenge you. Does Islam affirm original sin? I hope you'll accept. You're mistaken. Your Quran and Sunnah affirms the doctrine of original sin, and I'm willing to debate you anytime, any place. Maybe we can do it at ABN. I hope you accept the challenge. Go ahead, David. All right. The Quran claims over and over and over again throughout to be clear. It claims to be clear. And, and it also claims in Surah 2, verse 106 and 16, 101, that earlier verses are abrogated or canceled by later verses. What do we find? Yes, you do find uh, passages in the Quran uh, which say you fight in self-defense. Those aren't the final revelation. You also have Surah 929, which we've already quoted, fight those who do not believe. If you tell me it means something else, it means fight in self-defense, you're telling me Allah just isn't clear. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He, he, he should have stated it more clearly. You could speak better than Allah. And it's not just 929. If we look over and over again in Surah 9, Sir, uh, verse 73, O prophets, strive hard against the unbelievers and hypocrites and be unyielding to them. Be unyielding to who? Unbelievers, not people who are attacking you. Verse 111 David, David. defines Muslims as people who slay in the name of Allah. This is the hard part. I hate to, I hate to cut anyone off here, especially with this passion sure enthusiasm, do. but I got to do this. You know, that's what they tell me to do here. So we do appreciate, gentlemen, being on this program tonight. Glory to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's absolutely. Uh, thank God for the opportunity. And thank you, Omar and Abu, for being a part of this uh, cordial debate tonight. Got a lot of things covered in the last uh, uh, hour and a half, two hours here. And we are grateful for everyone here that's been watching our program, has been calling in. Continue to uh, stay tuned this week as we continue with our Jesus or Muhammad marathon. My name is Chris. God bless you. Thanks for, thanks for your participation tonight. We'll see you next time.